everyone, this is Velo here. In this video, I'm going to be going over the active transport notes. Okay, so just to review, before we get to active transport, let's review what passive transport is. So remember, passive transport, like diffusion, and passive transport in general, requires no energy. And substances move from high to low concentration. So where there's a lot of a solute to where there's not a lot of a solute. That is passive transport. And this just happens um, naturally. There's no energy that requires this to happen. Active transport, on the other hand, is the opposite of this. Energy in the form of ATP is required. And instead of going from high to low, we're going to have molecules go, or solutes, whatever it is, go in the opposite direction. They're going to go against the concentration gradient. So instead of going from high to low concentration, we're going to force these solutes, particles, molecules, whatever, from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. So since we're going like against the grain, against the tide, so to speak, this requires energy. Um, there's a few different types of passive transport we're going to talk about. The first is the sodium potassium pump. So first, let's just talk about this from the perspective of passive transport. So Na is sodium and K is potassium. So there is a lot of sodium over here and not a lot over here. So naturally, sodium will want to move in this direction from high to low, right? That's the type of pass, that's passive transport. And the potassium, which you have a lot over here, a high concentration and a low concentration over here of potassium, Potassium is going to want to move in this direction. Now, that's what would happen naturally if we were talking about passive transport. I realize they're ions and they would not go across the membrane because they need a channel. It's just to illustrate the concept. So that's what would naturally happen. However, we're going to use the sodium-potassium pump which is this thing here, it is a protein channel and ATP to move these things in the opposite direction. So to maintain these high concentrations, so we're actually gonna go in the opposite direction. So instead of sodium going this way, we're gonna actually force it to go in this direction. It doesn't wanna go in that direction, but we're gonna force it to. And that's gonna require ATP adenosine triphosphate. And again, we're going against their concentration gradients. We're going against the grain, so to speak. And this is active transport. So sodium would go in this direction, Na, which is sodium. And then potassium we're going to force in this direction. So it's opposite of passive transport. So to further illustrate this, I'm going to show you a video of a sodium potassium pump. Okay, so here um, in blue, those are the phospholipids that make up the membrane. And then the purple thing here is the protein channel. In this case, the carrier protein, or we could just call it the sodium potassium pump. And so the, again, we're going to have sodium go in the opposite direction that it doesn't want to go. There is more sodium outside of the cell in the green space, that's the outside of the cell, than there is in the inside of the cell. Uh, the, you could tell because it says cytoplasm. So sodium doesn't want to go out of the cell, but we're going to make it using the um, protein channel. So three sodium get in here. Now to force them in this direction, we're going to have to use ATP. 
So ATP, remember, is adenosine triphosphate. Tri meaning three. There's three phosphates. You can see the three Ps. One of those is going to break off, and that's how we use ATP for energy to do things. It's going to cause this protein channel to change shapes to push the sodium out of the cell. Again, that required energy to do that, to push the sodium in the direction it doesn't want to go. And then we're going to push the potassium in the direction it doesn't want to go. So we're going to have um, potassium jump in, and we're going to push it inside of the cell. There's already a lot of potassium in here, and as soon as that phosphate detaches, this changes shapes again, and then we put the potassium into the cell. Um, and I have this video posted in Teams if you want to watch it. So to summarize this, okay, I'm just going to draw a really simple diagram here. Pretend that's the cell membrane. This is the inside of the cell. This is the outside of the cell. So we're going to take three sodium ions from inside the cell are going to enter the carrier protein, the pump. And then we're going to use ATP to force the sodium out of the cell. Again, there's already a lot of sodium here in this space. So we're forcing it to go into a direction it doesn't want to go. And then as soon as that ATP releases, uh, or as soon as that ATP, excuse me, changes the shape of the protein channel, we're going to release sodium out of the cell. So it's going to, we're going to push it out of the cell where it doesn't want to go. And then we're going to push the potassium. We're going to push two potassium. Um, into the cell. Because again, there's a lot of potassium over here already. So we're pushing it into a direction it doesn't want to go. So we're going to take potassium that is outside of the cell, and it's going to enter that carrier protein, the sodium potassium pump. And as soon as that phosphate is removed and detaches, it changes shape again, and it's going to release that potassium into the cell. Again, we're forcing things to go in a direction they don't want to go. Remember, we're going from, this is active transport, so we're going from low to high concentration. Um, there are two other types of active transport we're going to talk about. The next one is endocytosis. So we were just talking about things moving across the membrane. Endo and exocytosis, which we're going to talk about next, involve moving large quantities of materials at a time. And this will involve vesicles. Remember, vesicles are like vehicles. They are used for transport of materials in the cell, like in to the cell, out of the cell, and then around inside of the cell. So what happens is the membrane will form a vesicle and pinch itself off um, to create that vesicle. So let me, let me show you a video of that. All right, so I'm going to show you a video of endocytosis. So endo means within. So this involves bringing materials into the cell. So here we have our cell membrane, just a really simplified image of that because you can't see the phospholipids. And we're going to take things into the cell. So the cell kind of um, creates this little pocket, and then it's going to pinch off to create a vesicle. And that's going to go into the cell. And again, this is posted in Teams. So um, endocytosis is taking in large quantities. And these can be solids or liquids. Uh, there are two types of endocytosis because we could either be taking in solids or liquids, and we have two different uh, names for that. So both of these are a type of endocytosis. 
So we have phagocytosis, which is taking in solids, so like food or anything solid, maybe macromolecules like carbohydrates, whatever, stuff being taken into the cell. And this is what we call cell eating. And then penocytosis is taking in liquids, uh, and this is cell drinking. So this involves taking liquids into the cell. So if I play the rest of the video, you'll see that. So this is also endocytosis. This is penocytosis, that cell drinking, which as the previous example, this was phagocytosis because those were solid molecules, probably macromolecules. And then here is penocytosis, which is cell drinking, taking in liquids. Again, both are a type of endocytosis because both are taking things into the cell. Another really cool example of phagocytosis, um, which is a type of endocyto endocytosis, is um, white blood cells um, will attack and basically eat and consume bacteria. So white blood cells are part of your immune system. Um, so this is in the middle here. I know it's a crude drawing or crude video, but here in the middle we have the white blood cell and then these other cells are red blood cells. So this would be in your bloodstream. And then this little thing is a bacteria. So your white blood cells are your body's immune system defense. So it will take care of foreign things like a bacteria cell um, that could possibly make you sick. So literally it is chasing it around. Okay. There's another one over there. And then once it finally gets it, it will do endocytosis, um, specifically phagocytosis. It will basically eat. There it is. And it got it. And then it will digest it and break it down. So that's also an example of phagocytosis. If we get stuff into the cell, we also have to get rid of stuff out of the cell. So exocytosis is transporting materials out of the cell. Um, so it's just, it's the opposite of endocytosis. So that would be getting rid of stuff. So it's just the opposite. The vesicle will fuse with the membrane and release whatever it is. Maybe it's a waste product that the cell produced. Maybe it's proteins that were made. Maybe it's a hormone that needs to be released, waste, toxins. It could be a variety of things that will be released from the cell. And again, these processes, because you're um, you know, moving the cell membrane a lot, that requires ATP in order to accomplish that. 